Yeah, so we are uh, still in Isaiah. I told you it'd be a long haul, and uh, we're we're going to be going there till till probably about December, and uh, and so we're going to just keep kind of rehashing this idea of renewal from different angles. And so um, this morning, um, I I want to talk about um, this idea of being renewed from what remains, being renewed from what's left, and so. Um, if you're, if you're in this place and you've been uh, someone who's gone to church for a long amount of time, or, or maybe not even church, but, but uh, you, you've probably gone to camp before. Has anyone been to camp before? Yeah, okay, you've been away for a week or a few days. And, um, and so when I was growing up, my family and I, for those who, who may not know, my family and I moved to Zimbabwe for, I was there for four years, they were there for six um, and so during my high school years, I was in, in Zimbabwe, and um, we did camp a little differently. Uh, I would refer to our camp more as boot camp than, uh, than just like uh, the youth camps that I've seen happen here. Kids get it real nice and easy. They get a nice, comfortable bed, and, and there's hot meals in the morning, and, and there's, there's, you know, there, there's sessions for them to attend, and, and, you know, it's all geared towards them, and there's fun games to play and all that. Our, our camp was a little different. So um, my school said they wanted to take uh, all of us on a, on a camp, uh, camping experience, and so there was this uh, camp outside of the city that we were in, and, uh, and so they said, they said, okay, we go to this camp, and it's going to be all about team building and all about, uh, tr- they told us that they had like a high ropes course. They told us all the highlights, right? They've got a high ropes course, and they've got, a, they've got you know, tons of wildlife around, and you'll see all kinds of wildlife, and, and you know, we're, we're getting all excited for this. But um, a couple of the people who had been to this camp before were kind of warning us, hey, listen, there's, uh, there, there's some things that you may not know about this. It's not going to be as easy as they say. And sure enough, as we're pulling up uh, on the road that leads to the camp, all of a sudden the bus pulls over and the driver gets up and says, okay, we're broken down. Everybody grab your bags. And we didn't know this at the time, but we weren't actually broken down. He lied to us. The whole part of this camp starting was that you had to grab your bags and carry them up to the campground uh, through this wilderness trail um, in Africa where you're worried about snakes and all those wonderful things. And so you had to go marching up to this camp for a couple kilometers carrying your stuff. And they had told you to pack light. Um, but of course, not everyone listens to that, thinking they'll just get to roll their suitcase. And so some people had like rolling suitcases and had to try and lug those up. Those of us with gym bags were very, very happy. Um, And then we got to the place where we were going to be staying, and they weren't comfortable cabins. There weren't, there weren't even beds, actually. They had little uh, blankets that they had rolled out on cement floors, and that was where we were going to sleep. And so we pull into this place, and, and we're like, oh my goodness, what is this going to be like? And so we have our first night's sleep, and none of us have a good night's sleep, obviously, because we're sleeping on, on cement ground. And then we, we get up the next morning and they say, okay, this is going to be your best friend for the rest of the week. And they give all of our, they broke, broke us up into teams and they gave each team a giant blue rain barrel full of water. They said, this is your best friend for the week. Every team building exercise we do will be based around this barrel. And so they said the first thing that you need to know about this barrel is that it is already injured. And so this morning, we're going on a five-kilometer walk together, but your barrel is injured. And so what you have to do is you have to create a sling between two, uh, two what we called gum poles, which were uh, uh, gum tree uh, uh, wood um, that... that uh, it was just a smaller, a smaller tree. And so we had to create a sling with rope and with these two gum poles that then we as a team would carry with this rain barrel filled with water on this five-kilometer excursion. 
And so we as, as so, and, and we're evenly mixed, right? Guys and girls, and, and some of us are stronger, some of us are not so strong, you know? And so we, we quickly string up this, this makeshift sling. We make it work as best we can. We roll the barrel and put it down onto this sling. And then we have nothing else left to do but pick it up and start going. And like, this is the difference culturally, right? Is you do this in Canada and there better be a great prize at the end. There was no prize. It was just a fear of our elders that kept us going at that point, okay? Because things were allowed in, in, uh, in Zimbabwe schools that are not allowed here. And so we're carrying this barrel and, and we're doing our very best and, and me and this other guy keep taking turns being the ones right up next to the barrel, right in the middle between the two poles, trying to, trying to bear the most of the weight to help out those that are weaker that are at the back end. And so we're, we're trying and we're trying and we're walking and we're walking and it just feels like there's nothing left in us. And to top it all off, every once in a while, every time we get to this certain marker, the guides then go, okay, now put it down because we have something we want to talk about. And so at each pause, they would talk to us. They would tell us uh, about team building. They would talk, they would kind of debrief the last kilometer or whatever we had walked. And then, and then they said, okay, time to pick it up again. And once again, we'd all groan and we'd go and we'd pick up this barrel. And so I remember it was in the last kilometer and we were getting, we were getting so tired. We were so exhausted. Like, I'm talking like, like I'm, a, I'm, I, I'm sweating upon sweating upon, like I am soaked. My, my friends are soaked in sweat. They're, we're, we're all just done. We're, we're at our worst. We're dirty. You know, in Zimbabwe, it was, it's, it's very, um, there's a lot of sand, but there's also a lot of red clay. And so what happens is the sand and the red clay kind of mix with each other sometimes, and then you get this really red earth that just sticks to everything. And so we're, we're covered in mud and dust and dirt. We're, we're exhausted as all get out. We're having, we're having members of our team break down in tears and having to, to get them to, okay, come on, you can do this, you can do this. We're, we're trying to pick each other up. We're trying to get this task accomplished because they did, the one thing they did do for us was provide us with a bit of competitive drive. They kind of identified those of us who were the most competitive and put us on different teams. And so we were kind of racing against other teams for a certain degree. But I remember about halfway through the last kilometer, someone, someone took a wrong step and the whole thing just slipped and fell. And so we're just like, we're like we don't have it. We can't, we can't do it. We're, we're done. We're, emo we're exhausted emotionally. We're exhausted physically. We're at the very end of our rope. This rain barrel was so heavy. What are we supposed to do now? And the guide said, well, what do you have left? What do you have left? And our answer was nothing. We have, we have nothing left. And he said, I bet you that if you really set your mind to it, Come on, think about it. Who can go to a different place that they've never been before? Who can, who can take the brunt that hasn't been taking the brunt yet? Who, could you try pushing it so that the gum poles are above your shoulders for a little while so that you've, you've got a bit of a different position? What, what do you have left? Just switch it up a little bit. Find what will work, but you all you have is a half a kilometer left. Would you just try? And so grumbling and, and getting mad and... I think one of, one of our girls might have said something pretty nasty to the guide at the time. We all kind of gather up. We look at each other and go, okay, are we going to do this? And it just seems like everyone's like, yeah, okay, let's give this a shot. And so with one last effort, we bend down, we grab this big rain barrel, and we, we take it on this sling, and we take it for that last half a kilometer. And I remember as we got to our camp, just seeing that, that, that place where we slept. And I'll tell you what, I never desired a concrete floor more. <laughs> but we're walking and we're walking and we're getting closer. And as we cross that line to where the barrel needs to be set back down, we all just go, oh, thank goodness we did it. 
And so that, that, that uh, afternoon, it was like the best thing ever. We had all accomplished this great thing together. We had mustered up what was left of us. We had been pushed to our limit, and yet we had pushed each other beyond what we thought our limits were, and we were able to do more than we thought we were able to accomplish. And the rest of the week was the best time I think I can ever remember because we accomplished something wonderful together. Here's what I want us to understand this morning. I want us to experience in times of desperation, in times when we feel like we have nothing left in the tank, I want us to experience a renewal from the very little that remains because we have Jesus on our team, on our side, in our group, and he is walking with us. I know you've got heavy burdens to bear. I know that you're going through a lot. I know that there are tre- there, the tread on your tires is wearing thin. I know that life comes at you from all sides sometimes, but what remains is enough. When you have Jesus, what remains is enough. Maybe you feel exhausted, lost, left alone, or maybe even defeated, but what do you have left? What remains is enough. And so this morning, uh, we're, we're catching up in Isaiah, and, and we're, we're looking at the nation of Judah, and, and we're actually going to be reading mostly from 2 Kings this morning, because it tells the story that, I, that this section of Isaiah tells um, a little more succinctly, but it tells the same story. But Judah really was left without much. Nation after nation around them had fallen to Assyria. The Assyrian Empire was one like the world had never seen before. It was sweeping across and it was conquering nation after nation after nation. It was conquering world powers. It was conquering long-standing world powers. But nation after nation, power after power was falling to Assyria. Not only that, but Judah was not much on the internals either. So externally, they were seeing defeat happen all around them. Internally, they were seeing as their, their priests and those that were accountable to, to keep the nation focused on God were turning into drunkards and liars and, and, doing, and worshiping other gods. They were, they were watching as they, they had had some bad kings in the past and some really bad things happen. Judah didn't have much internally. It also didn't have much hope externally. Judah really didn't have much. In fact, it really uh, illustrates this here in 2 Kings uh, chapter 18. We're going to read verse 13 and then jump all the way to verse 23. It says, in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. Then verse 23 says, uh, this is the the king of Assyria now, or the, the messenger from the king of Assyria now talking to the nation of Judah. It says, come now, make a wager with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you are able on your part to set riders on them. This is what he's doing. He's going, you are so weak. You have almost no army left. You have almost nothing left to fight me with. So I'll tell you what. If you can just muster up 2,000 soldiers, I'll give them horses to ride on. This is how, how cocky, how prideful, how, how arrogant the, the king of Assyria had become that, that he would offer, he would offer 2,000 horses if Judah would just be able to find the riders. Now here's, here's some math to just really uh, make you understand how minuscule the army of Judah would have been at this point. They couldn't even find 2,000 men to be riders. And yet, later on in the story, we're going to read that the, the Assyrian army had over 185,000. So not even able to muster 2,000, and then 185,000. I mean, 10 times out of 10, which side are you going with? And so... And so Judah didn't have much, but they did have a good king. 
2 Kings 18, 3 to 7 says, And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, talking about Hezekiah, according to all that his father David had done. He removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah. And he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made, for until, until those days the people of Israel had made offerings to it. He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept the commandments that the Lord, command, that the Lord commanded Moses, and the Lord was with him. Okay, here's what we need to know when we read the Old Testament and when we read the book of Isaiah especially. We need to think past, present, future, okay? So this all happened in the past, that is clear. Okay, so the nation of Judah has nothing left except for a good king who fears the Lord. We, in this day and age, go through a lot of things, but we have a king whose name is Jesus. And so in the same way that a good king was enough for God to do a work that we're going to read about here in just a second in Judah. A good king is all we need today to be able to see God do a good work through you and I. And in the same way, our future is headed towards a good king whose name is Jesus, who will reign eternally, who will take away every, every sickness, who will take away every bit of struggle in our lives. We will live without struggle. We will live without sickness. We will live without pain because of the reign of Jesus Christ in eternity. And so in the same way, what is communicated to us about, about the nation of Judah is true for us today, but will be true for us for all of eternity. This is good news for us to cling to, that all we need is a good king. A good king in Judah made the difference. In Isaiah 32, verses 1 through 4, it says, Behold, the king will reign in righteousness, and princes will rule in justice. Each will be like a hiding place from the wind, a shelter from the storm, like streams of water in a dry place like the shade of a great rock in a weary land. Then the eyes of those who see will not be closed, and the ears of those who hear will give attention. The heart of the hasty will understand and know, and the tongue of the stammerers will hasten to speak distinctly. See, what we, what we have now, we will ha what we have now in part, we will have in eternity in full. Church, we believe in healing now. We believe in God doing wonderful things now. But our king who reigns, our king who will be there for eternity is setting up this future for us, that there will be a place where, 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 where um, the eyes of those who see will not be closed and the ears of those who hear will give attention. There's going to be this place of we will understand fully, we will know fully, we will experience fully who God is. And so our hope, church, is, is, is one of a, a threefold hope. It's that we see what God has done in the past, we, we recognize who he is in our present, and we celebrate what we're headed for in the future, that we are headed for an eternity with Jesus as our good king. There's all we need is a good king, and you have one. All you need is a good king, and you have one. So here's what we, uh, here's, as we pick up the story, here's, here's how it kind of unfolds. Sennacherib attacks uh, Judah after taking down Israel. So, so not only does Judah watch as nation upon nation falls to Assyria. Now they watch the nation of Israel, their brothers and sisters who they've been separated from for a little while, but, but really often are talked about in the same breath, Israel and Judah. And so they watch the nation of Israel fall to Assyria. They watch other nations fall to Assyria, and then Assyria turns their eyes on Judah. And remember, Judah is a nation, not just one city. And so what the Bible tells us is that um, fortified, fortified city after fortified city, that, that the most uh, strong cities of Judah 
were falling one by one by one to the nation of Assyria as they were attacking. So, so not only are, are all those outside of you falling, but the things that you counted on the most in your, in your existence, the, the fortified cities, the ones that were supposed to be stopgaps for invading armies, they're falling one by one by one as well. And then the last stop for this army, of course, is Jerusalem. So Hezekiah is king at this time of Judah, and so he is reigning in Jerusalem. That's this is the the heart of the city. This is the heart of the nation of Judah, right? The city of Jerusalem. He's reigning from Jerusalem, and so um, the na- the 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 army of Assyria shows up at Jerusalem's door. We're told that Hezekiah is a good king. He still has weak moments, but but he's a good king who depends on the Lord. And so when Sennacherib, the, the leader of the Assyrian army, the king of Assyria, shows up at his door, Hezekiah has a natural reaction. Again, remember, they have less than 2,000 soldiers to put up against 185,000. And so, so, so Hezekiah, in his weakness, in his, in his moment of understand, understandable anxiety, says to, to the king, of Assyria. He says, what, what, what do you need? What do you need from us? What, what can I give you that will uh, satisfy you to just leave us alone, to, to not invade Jerusalem? And so they gather up all the gold that they have stored up in both the throne room and, and in the temple and in all places in Jerusalem, and they give it to the king of Assyria, thinking that that will pacify him. But even with that payment, he decides to invade all the more. Sennacherib takes payment and advances anyways. Then he sends messengers to try and get Judah to surrender. And this is where we pick up the story in 2 Kings uh, chapter 18, verse 28. It says, Then the, the Rabshakeh stood and called out in a loud voice in the language of Judah, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria, Thus says the king, do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you out of my hand. Do not let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord by saying, the Lord will surely deliver us and this city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, make your peace with me and come out to me. Then each one of you will eat of his own vine and each one of you and each one of his own fig tree and each one of you will drink the water of his own cistern until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of all trees and honey that you may live and not die. And do not listen to Hezekiah when he misleads you by saying, the Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations ever delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where, where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim, Hina, and Eva? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who among all the gods of all the lands have delivered their lands out of my hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? But the people were silent and answered him not a word. For the king's command was, do not answer him. So this is what we're seeing. The one who had leveled everything you had ever known and trusted in is coming up against you. He's leveled it all. He's destroyed it all. He's, he's, he's conquered it all. He is coming with a force of 185,000 to your city's doors and saying, if you will just give up, don't listen to your king. I understand your king loves the Lord. I understand your king thinks that the Lord will take care of you, but, but he's not going to be able to do it. That's the, look at all the other gods that I've conquered. Right, this is what he's saying. He's saying, I've conquered these other gods. These other nations have had gods that, that weren't able to stand up to me. I cannot be stopped. Church, sometimes we face situations that feel like they cannot be stopped that we've watched others go through them and it hasn't been stopped. We've watched other people struggle and it hasn't stopped. We've watched other people go through these things and we're going, they they have not been able to be stopped. 
And so our logic and our and maybe even the, the enemy comes to our comes to our brain, comes to our, 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 our ears and says, Have you not seen what's happened over here? Have you not seen what's happened over there? Have you not seen how it didn't work out for that person or how it didn't work out for this person or how, how things kept going wrong over here, things kept going wrong over there? I, it's going to be the same for you. These are the lies that start to work. Or wait, don't trust in the Lord. No one else has been able to stop this. But we have a Lord who is not like other gods, who is not like other people, who is stronger than anything we may face. But we may be like Hezekiah, when God, or, or the nation of Judah, going, God, where are you? I know we have a good king. I know he loves you. I know his faith is in you. But is that enough? Is that enough? What remains, church, is enough. What can the Lord do against my finances? What, the, what can the Lord do against my health? What can the Lord do against the things that are attacking my family? All that was left was Jerusalem. All that was left was Jerusalem, a prophet, and a good king. But that was enough in faith. Hezekiah Look at this, goes to Isaiah in 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 4. It says, therefore, lift up your prayer for the remnant that is left. Lift up a prayer for the remnant that is left. Church, what you have, what remains in you is enough. The remnant that remains in you is enough through faith. This is what Isaiah did. He turned, he turned to, or this is, what, this is what Hezekiah did. He turned to the messenger of God. He turned to the man who spoke to God on the regular, who heard from God on the regular, and said, would you go and would you pray for the remnant? Would you pray for what's left? And so church, what, I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what's beat you down. I don't know what's hurt you. I don't know what you've struggled with. But what I can tell you is that if all you have is a little bit left, that if all you'll do is put your faith in God, if you'll turn to God, then what you have left will be enough through faith. Because what you have left will be in the arms of the one who can multiply it, who can do more than we could ask or imagine. This is what's beautiful, though, that Isaiah comes back from talking to God and prophesies that God would not let victory come to Sennacher, the, the king of Assyria, and that he would die by the sword. But here is the rub. Okay, here's the, here's the moment where it's, it's a hard truth for us. Because right now, it sounds great. Like, oh, right? Like, I've only got a little bit left. God's going to take it. He's going to use it. And, and I'm so excited for, for God to take what little is left and, and, and do something wonderful in it. And, and, and I'm excited to see God's victory in my life. But here's the, here's the rub of this whole thing. Isaiah prophesies that Sennacherib will die. He prophesies that they will not make it into Jerusalem. Yet God doesn't take away the problem right away. Sennacherib remains at the door of the city. The king of Assyria remains at the door of the city. So the attacker, the one you fear, is still sitting at your door. This is why faith is required. This is why faith in what faith from what remains is enough is because we have to be willing to, to have God answer us favorably, but not take away the problem. See, church, God may promise you health, but not take away your sickness. He may promise life, but not take away the threat of death. He may promise you provision, but not take away the threat of bankruptcy. There are moments in life, there are seasons in life, church, where God's provision is for the next step. And it feels like we're, we're not, we don't know what's going to happen beyond that next step. And then we take the next step and God provides for that next step. And then we take another step and God provides for that next step. But sometimes, 
getting to that next step is in a season of waiting. This is what Judah is experiencing, that there's, there's this army that is threatening to invade, staying outside, and they come over and over again to threaten more and more. God, God promised victory, but yet didn't take away the attacker. 2 Kings 19, 10 to 15 says, Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah. Do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you by promising that Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands, devoting them to destruction. And shall you be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered them, the nations of my fathers that my fathers destroyed, Gozan, Haran, Rezeph, and the people of Eden who were in Telassar? Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, the king of the city of Sepharvaim, the king of Hina, or the king of Eva? Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. This is important. So Senchera sends a messenger with a letter for Hezekiah. Once again, threatening invasion. What are you going to do? No other God has been able to stop. So Hezekiah has gone to God, has gone to Isaiah, has gone to the man of God, asked for a word from the Lord. The word of the Lord has come back and said, don't you worry, he won't be able to invade. And he's going to die by the sword. And after that prophecy, now comes a stronger uh, threat of war from the king of Assyria, saying, you will not prevail. Church, sometimes we have to go through that test of faith. Sometimes we have to go through that moment where, where we, we go, okay, God, I believe that there's victory coming, but the threat doesn't go away. Does our faith remain strong? Does our faith remain in Jesus, our cornerstone like we talked about? But here's what I love. Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord. Church, what remains in you is enough through prayer. What remains in you is enough if you'll just pray about it. Church, I know that you have faith. I know that, you, that things that, that you're, you're, you're hoping that what God, what, what, what little is left in you will get you through. I know that we hit seasons of life where we have to muster up enough faith and whatever. But if we do not turn to God in prayer when we experience challenges, we will not see his promises come to fruition. We want to spend time in prayer. This is the, this is the faith of Hezekiah that he, he said, okay, I went, to, I went to the Lord through the man of God once. Now I'm receiving more threats. Now now I'm going to God himself. And he goes to the house of the Lord. He lays this threatening letter before the Lord and goes, God, help me. Church, sometimes you got to take that letter. You got to take that, that bad diagnosis. You got to take that. You got to take that, that bill that you have no clue how, it's, how you're going to pay it. You got to take that, that text message from your, your family member that just broke your heart and you've got to take it and you've got to put it before the Lord and go, Lord, I don't know what to do with this. I don't know how I'm going to handle this, but I have a God who is greater. I have a God who is bigger. I have a God who can heal every wound. I have a God who can banish every sickness. I have a God who can heal every family dispute that has ever occurred. I have a God who can do more than I can ask or imagine and I'm laying it before you. This is how we live the Christian life. We've talked lots, church, the last little while about stop running around, stop trying to make your own plan, stop doing all this. Do you ever just stop and take the thing that's hurting you and just lay it before the Lord? Have we taken it? Have we tru truly laid it before the Lord and said, God, I don't know what to do here. Church, I gotta be honest. I don't know. I don't know how to deal with some of the things that come up as a pastor. How, how do you how do you deal with?
counseling two very different people in, in the space of one week. One where someone is clinging to life and wanting it so badly, but there's a threat of it ending. And then two days later, going and, and sitting in the living room of someone who's going, I'm old, I have no family left, I have no purpose left, why doesn't the Lord just take me? How do you balance those two things? If you don't know, I don't know either. But what I do know is that when I lay it before the Lord, that He leads, that He guides, and He allows us grace for where we are not strong enough to deal with it ourselves. We have to take what we have and lay it before the Lord. And sometimes all you have is a threat, some faith. Second Kings 19, 32 to 37 says this. It says, Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city or shoot an arrow there. This is God answering Hezekiah. Or come before it with a shield or cast up a siege mound against it. By the way that he came, by the same he shall return. And he shall not come into this city, declares the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it. I'm going to invite the worship team to come on up. For I will defend this city to save it. For my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. And that night the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when the people arose early in the morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. Then Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went home and lived at Nineveh. And he was worshipping in the house of Nisroch, his god, Adramelech and Sherezer, his sons, struck him down with the sword and escaped into the land of Ararat. And Esarhaddon, his son, reigned in his place. So no one did anything but have faith and have a prayer. And the angel of the Lord kills 185,000. Church, I don't know what you have left. I don't know if you're in a season where you feel like you've got lots, where you feel like, hey, I'm good. I'm a, like, there's an abundance uh, available to me. Like, I, I feel strong. I feel uh, excited. I feel like things are going really, really, really well. But maybe you're in a season where you're saying, I have nothing left. I am beat down. I am exhausted. I have no clue where my next answer to prayer is coming from. I don't know what I can do to make this relationship with my family better. I don't know what I can do to transform my finances and get to a place where I can afford it. I don't know what to do to, to deal with the pain that I'm in. I don't know what to do to, to deal with the sickness that I'm going through. I have nothing left. I have very little left. Church, what remains is enough. When all you have is a threat, some faith, and a prayer, what remains is enough because you have a good king. You have a king who is reigning. You have a king who can do more than you can ask or imagine. What remains is enough. God has given victory in the past. And though we may only see it in part in our present, it is guaranteed in full in our future. What remains is enough. And so church, this morning what I want to do is I just want to encourage you. Your healing is coming. Your provision is coming. Your answer is coming. And even if it's not now, 
It will be in eternity. It's coming. Set your hope on Jesus. It's coming. Let it wash over your soul. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. What remains in you is enough. Stand this morning. We, we, uh, speak a, a message like this when we talk about the word of God in this, in this tone I recognize that there are many here and, and many different stories so if you're here this morning and you're like that's a great reminder Pastor Nathan for when I'm going through that but that's just not me right now that's wonderful praise God lift him up Let's. wow awesome but there are those of us who are on our last bit. We're on our last dollar. We're on our last nerve. We're on our last emotion. We're on our last bit of strength. If that's you in this place this morning, I just want to say we would love to pray with you. There's no pressure. But if you need prayer this morning, the front here is available. You don't need to you don't need to worry about who's looking at you. We're all on each other's side. We all want to support each other through our hard times. So if you're going through a hard time, I just want to open up this place. We'll have someone come and pray with you. I'll be down to pray. But let's sing Oceans together. Let's sing that song together. But if you need prayer, you're more than welcome at the front here to be prayed for. Let's sing.